But open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. And we're just, we are going through the book of Romans and, and um, kind of outlined it uh, for us as I, as I read through it. The book of, I love the book of Romans, but um, last week, chapters 1 through 4 deal with justification. Justification is standing right with God, to be justified, to be exonerated by God, and being called blameless, and as though you have not sinned, is to be justified by receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. We now become justified before God. A great example uh, of this and, and God's great mercy in our life in justifying us, I heard it like this, if you're in a courtroom and you're sitting there before the judge and you've done something horrible and the judge says, well, it's the death sentence for you. And then based upon God's mercy in this scenario, it would be like the judge saying, it's the death sentence for you, and then he comes off the bench and he disrobes and he goes and takes the death sentence for you. The judge takes the death sentence for you. That is to be justified before God when you receive His Son, Jesus as your Savior, that you need salvation. At that moment, you are justified before the Lord. You are justified. Justification is a... um, a one moment time in your life. It is one moment in this life. Now, when we look in Romans 5 through 8, this is what we're going to look through today, we're going to look at sanctification. Sanctification is an ongoing process in your life. It's an ongoing process. Uh, The Apostle Paul wrote this. He says, I have not arrived. I have not arrived to perfection. How many of you realize that when you follow the Lord, you realize that at times, there, there are times, especially in my life, as I follow the Lord, I, I, I'm like, oh, wow, I did that great. I did that good. I was Christ-like in that moment. And then when I, when I begin to do that and understand that, it always seems like I get to the next step and I feel like and I see that God is so much still holier than I. And there's still another level to my sanctification. How many of you ever realized that before in your life? I've realized that so many times. I'm like, man, I did that good. And I, and I did, a, you know, follow the Lord. I did that good. And it's like, then there's this season where it's like, oh, my goodness. I really do fall short of his perfection. And there's still another pursuit of it. It, it reminds me, when I, was, when I was playing football, we had a coach who would do this to us. We would be running, and, and he would do this. He would say, okay, this is your last, your last sprint, and you're going to run to me. And when you get past me, you'll be done. That was the finish line. We're like, all right, you know, you're overweight. I'm going to get there quick, you know. So we, we get down. He blows the whistle. As soon as he blows the whistle, he starts backpedaling as fast as he can. And as soon as we got close enough, he would turn and start running the other way. And we were like, let me just say this. That is your sanctification process. Oh, I can, I can do that. That's, that's the level of perfection. As soon as you start going there, you realize how much further you have to go. You understand that? And that, that's, that's, that's life. That's sanctification. Which sanctification ultimately leads to glorification. An instant moment that lasts forever. An instant moment you will be glorified with God. When you leave this earthly body, you'll be glorified with the Lord. We're going to look at sanctification in Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. And I'm going to show you, based upon justification, being justified by the Lord, here is what we receive. And I want to show you that by what we receive through justification, what that looks like in a life that's lived through sanctification, a sanctified life. I want to see how those things are lived out, really. If I'm justified, then I should live a sanctified life. And I live, if I live a sanctified life, then I should live a spirit-filled life a life of obedience to the Holy Spirit. Okay? So let's take a look. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says there, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, 
and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Hope does not disappoint. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The moment that we are justified by God, there are several things that are given to us that we should take and live them out in a sanctified life. And we're going to go through these things. Check it out what we got. We have, number one, we got peace with God. Peace with God. I always tell, uh, growing up, when I get into school, I would find the, the baddest dude, the best fighter, or the biggest dude, and I would become his friend. That's, that's how I survived. <laughs> hey, don't laugh. It worked. I'm still alive today. Right? I find the big, baddest dude, and sometimes the baddest dude was not the biggest dude. I learned that quick. And I would become their friend. Be like, hey, man, do you want lunch? I'll buy you lunch. And I become their friend. We have peace with God, meaning this. When we become justified, automatically, when we're justified by the blood of Jesus, we become friends with God. And he is the biggest, the baddest dude forever. All right? That's a good thing. Also, we have this. We have access by faith into grace, which produces a rejoicing. And that rejoicing is in the hope of the glory of God and in our sufferings. And when we rejoice in our sufferings, it produces endurance. And endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope gives us divine appointments in our life. That's what it says. Right there. Now let me, let me under, help you understand about justification and having access into God's grace. This right here is my uh, card to get into this building. Okay? If I don't have this card, what I have to do is wait by the door for another teacher. And then when they open the door, I run and stop it. Okay? But I have to have this card. The moment you are justified by God, by believing in Jesus, you get this. You're like, I get to get into middle school? No. You, get, you follow, my, my, follow my metaphor, okay? You get one of these. Now, you have access to come into the grace of God and access any benefit you want because you're justified. Because you're justified. Meaning this, I could come into the grace of God and look at the big screen. I can come into the grace of God. I got a big kitchen. I can come into the grace of God. I got a classroom. I've got lots of other people to hang out with. I've got, I've got, I got insurance. I've got insurance. <laughs> God's insurance is better. But I got insurance, and guess what? I have a retirement. That's a benefit. Now, <laughs> we won't go there, but God's retirement plan's better than, than that. I'll, I think I, I, the other day I got a thing that says, you will be able to retire when you're 70 and a half. Yeah. I'm like, a half? Really? Come on. Round it down. Um, but I get benefits because I'm justified. I have access. The moment that you believe in Jesus, you become justified. This is placed around your neck, and now you can get into the grace of God and take part of any benefit that you want to because you're justified. Matter of fact, now because you're justified, any work that you do in the grace of God now produces for you a reward in heaven. But if you get in here without one of these, and you're doing work, and you're not a teacher, you're not justified, and you're saying, well, my good works in here, even though I'm not an employee, will benefit me, and I can, I can get a retirement. No, you can't. You're not on the payroll. And a lot of people will stand before God and say, well, look, hey, I did a lot of good things. And he's going to say, where's this? I don't know you. You're not one of my employees. You're not justified by my son's blood. Go into outer darkness. Ugh. All right? Okay? So this is our justification, and it gives us peace with God. And what does that mean? What is, what is a life of peace with God? We're going to go through all this. I love this. What does a life of peace with God look like? Look at Romans 5, 8. It says this, But God shows His love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life, more than that, 
we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So what does the peace of God look like in somebody who's living out? If I'm justified, now I have the peace with God, what does the peace of God look like lived out? Here's what it says. It says, it is a life of reconciliation, meaning this, now I can have intimate fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Reconciliation means to make two, one. It is a life married to the Spirit of God. And not only that, but now there is no fear. We are saved from the wrath. There is no fear of God's wrath. None whatsoever. None. No fear of wrath. No fear of wrath. How many of you ever feared your dad's wrath? Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. I have. I'm like, ooh. And, and for some of us, we understand discipline. And some of us should have never, ever experienced our father's wrath. Our father's wrath. I experienced my dad's discipline. And I'm a better person for it. Honest to God, I'm a better person for it. But there were times where, not towards us kids, but I saw my dad, usually when he was watching the Dallas Cowboys, but I saw my dad's wrath. And I thought, that's his wrath, which was different than his discipline. But that's his wrath. I don't want to get on that side. Okay? All right, I don't want to get on that side. My dad... My dad told me one time, he said, he, and I'll never forget this, and I forget why he told me this, but I, was, I said something to him about him you know, whipping us and disciplining us. And he, says, you know, he said he did it out of love. He said, you know that if somebody came to the house and tried to get you, do you know what I'd do to them? I was like, what, Dad? What would you do? He said, over my dead body, I'd kill him. I was like, that was my dad's wrath. God's wrath is reserved for not his children. So there is no fear in the future. And I know we talk about in Revelation, the tribulation. Guys, you don't have to fear that stuff. Why? Because we've been justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. There is peace with God, reconciliation, a fellowship with the Spirit, no fear of wrath. And here's one thing I love about this. Listen to this. You can write this quote down. No fear of wrath. We have a sincere expectation of His love, not His wrath. And write this down. In your life, a sanctified life, when we live at peace with God, here is something that is shown in somebody that lives this out, is this. They expect not good things, but they expect God things. There's a difference. There's a difference. Expecting good things in your life, you will be sorely disappointed. Very much so. Now... <laughs> Do, you want, do I want you to have good things? Does God want you to have good things? Yes. But what I'm saying is, if we put our trust in a seeing good things come to pass, instead of putting our trust in expecting God things to happen, what will happen is when the bad things happen, and they will happen, you will question, God, where are you? The good and the bad come, but here's the one thing that you and I have with peace with God is this. When the good comes, God's there. When the bad comes, God's there. Right? So expect God things to happen in your life. That's what the peace of God lived out looks like. The second thing we have is access into grace. Romans 5.17. This is what this looks like lived out. Romans 5.17 says this, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more would those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all men, so the act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. What does it look like? The first thing that access into His grace, when somebody has been justified and has access into God's grace, what does that look like lived out? You will see this in people who live a sanctified life, a life set apart solely for God's purposes, is this. They bring life with their life. They bring it. You ever been around somebody that was, when you left their presence, you were like, I feel better? I feel like I've had an experience with maybe the Lord? How many of you ever been around somebody and you left them and you go, oh my gosh, I don't want to get around that person. Debbie Downer the whole time. You know what I'm saying? 
But what happens is, is that when we have access to any benefit of God for our life, it brings us joy and life and a life that's lived reigning with Him and it brings life to other people. It always will bring life to other people. Okay? And that's the one thing it does. You'll see that in people who live a sanctified life. Also, a life of power to reign and be holy and power to crucify the flesh. Look at Romans six twelve. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin shall not have dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under what? Grace. How sweet the sound. Grace. If you're under grace, guess what? Now you have been given God's favor. You have access into all of His benefits. You have access to, into His favor, which gives us strength and power to do what? Crucify your flesh and to present your members now as instruments of righteousness and holiness to be used by God, for God, and allow God to use and use uh, through you. Amen? That's what that looks like, is a crucified life. Access into His grace, and when we live a sanctified life, it is a life where we are constantly crucifying our flesh. How many of you ever had the opportunity to crucify your flesh? Like every, everybody should be like, I oh, like every day. All right? Every day. Just if you want to hear your flesh talk, do this, do this. When you're hungry, and say you want something sweet like ice cream or a cookie or a donut, your flesh will say, Give me the donut. And it'll sound just like that. But it'll be a moment, like, Brr, har. All right? You ever been in a quiet place and all of a sudden your stomach goes, Brr, har. And you're like, I don't know what that was. <laughs> Right? Awkward situations, everybody sitting there. I was, at, I was at jury duty. We're sitting in these church pews, and all of a sudden my stomach went. And I was like, hmm. People looking around. It's so embarrassing. But your, your flesh will do things like that. You know your flesh will want to talk back to somebody when they're mean to you? Do you know that? Do you know your flesh will want to, when somebody cuts you off in traffic, will want to roll down the window and wave at them? Do you know that? Do you know that? Does anybody else have that desire sometimes? Don't raise your hand. Okay? I do sometimes, and I'm the preacher. All right? I'm the preacher. You know? How many of you watch the news and you get in the flesh? I watch the news, and I'm like, ooh. And instead of praying for people to get saved because God helped them on the news, man, those people need some Jesus. I'm like, take them out, Lord. Take them out now. Right? That's a fleshly prayer, is it not? It is so fleshly. It, listen, access into His grace, a life lived out, is a constant battle. You've been set free, but you haven't been set free so that you can sin more, so that grace may abound. You've been set free so that you can crucify your flesh and give Him power to crucify your flesh, because we as a church are supposed to be different from the world. You see that? And if we act like the world, then the world looks at us and says, well, there's nothing to your salvation. It's not real. It's fake. And you're self-righteous. I don't want it. You see what I'm saying? And it's a constant battle. And you say, well, how long will I have to crucify my flesh? Until the day you die. Because your flesh will be around you till the day you die. It will be there. You can move anywhere you want to. Utah, Canada, Mexico. Guess who will be there? You. You will. And unless you have the access into God's grace and living that out, you're going to ha lack power to crucify your flesh, which is a very difficult thing to do. Just try this. If you've never done this, fast for one day. Huh. Can I tell you about the first time I fasted? Oh, my gosh. Let me tell you about this. I was 18. I started following the Lord, man. I was on fire for Jesus, and I was like, I'm going to sanctify. Today is the day I'm not going to eat anything. I'm going to drink water. I'm going to fast, you know, because I read a story about like an Old Testament prophet who would just, you know, had all these miracles and everything, and they were fasting and everything, and I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to think and walk on water today. 
And so I didn't eat anything, and then 10 o'clock came around. Here's what I did. I said, Lord, I'm going to take communion <laughs> with a piece of bread and some grape juice. Just some communion, just to, just to fellowship with you. And I could see God sitting on his throne going, okay. <laughs> okay, Travis. Come, let's, let's take communion. So I take a bite of the bread. I have a, I have a slice of bread. So maybe I should just do a pinch. I was like, no, I'll just do a whole, you know, instead because my mom will get mad. God, my mom will get mad, God, if I just take part of the bread. So I got, I got to eat this whole bread. All right? So, and I was like, well, I don't need a sip. Well, I got this whole bread, so I need, I don't, can't just take a sip of grape juice. I, I, I got to get some grape juice. You know what I'm saying? So I got some grape juice and a thing of bread. So I took a bite of that. I'm like, Lord, you're good. You know, I'm going over scripture. Let me just tell you this. By the end of my communion, I had a ham sandwich. <laughs> With cheese, God, this is so horrible, and some bacon on that thing. It was the best communion ever, and that was the, that was the extent of me at the very beginning learning to crucify my flesh. That was the extent. That was how weak I was in crucifying the flesh. Really, honestly, that was how weak I was. I mean, I was just like, well, you know what you need with a ham sandwich and bacon? You need chips, bro. <laughs> and you know what you need to wash that down? More grape juice. And it was just got so bad. I, by the end of it, I was so full. <laughs> and I was so less sanctified than what I was before 10 o'clock. And so, anyway, I, I say all that because the next time I fasted, I made it a whole day. And I started to understand what it was to access his grace in overcoming some desires that I had that were not godly. That were not godly. Is eating ungodly? No, but it is a discipline that we use in our life because there will be ungodly desires and you're going to have to be able to tell your flesh by the grace of God, no. Right? Unlike me, it was like, by the grace of God, let's make a ham sandwich with some bacon on it, okay? That's giving in to it, all right? That's sinning, all right? I try to justify it before the Lord, and I could, I could just see him smiling like, oh, you got that one past me, Travis. Didn't see that one coming. So, but a life lived with the access of grace in God is a life that is sanctified. It's a life where we crucify our flesh on a day-to-day -day basis, and we have to do that. We have to do that in order to be different and live a holy life. Now, access into His grace not only is the power to overcome sin in our life and to crucify our flesh, but here's what access into His grace will produce in your life when it's lived out is a constant rejoicing. A constant rejoicing. A constant rejoicing. And we rejoice in two main areas. First one we, He says is this, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. It says in Scripture many times, it says in Habakkuk, it says that the, the earth will be, or hey guys, it says this, it says that the earth will be covered, um, just like the earth is covered by water, so the earth will be covered by the glory of God. It also says this in Colossians, it says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It says this in John 15, it says, producing fruit in your life, the fruit of the Spirit glorifies God. So glory of God is not just a future thing that we look forward to. The hope of the glory of God, but it is a present reality that we hope that the fruit that we produce glorifies God. It is the hope of the glory of God. It says this, it says this in 1 John, it says that we, if we know that He's returning and we believe this, He who knows this purifies Himself because this is the future hope of the glory of God. When Jesus shows up on the scene, the Spirit that is in you, you will see Him and you will be what you are supposed to be created for, the glory of God. <laughs> Just like a bird is created and made to fly like a fish is made for water, you were created for the glory of God. You were. You. You who have trouble crucifying your flesh and eating the bacon and ham sandwich. You were created, Travis, for the glory of God. You were created for the glory of God to bask in His presence and to reflect His goodness and to show people who He is. That's the glory of God. And we rejoice in that. 
Why, 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 what does it mean to rejoice and boast in that? Because of this. Now we get to do something for God because He's done so much for us. That's awesome. I rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Man, that one day everything will be set right. That there won't be any more death. That buzzards won't have anything to eat. I'll see my family. I'll see my friends that went on. The hope of the glory that the dead in Christ will pop out of their graves and the glory of God will surround the earth. I hope in that. That right there, I hope in. And I rejoice because I believe that it's true. I'm looking forward to it. Amen? God, I'm looking forward to that. I hope in the glory of God. God, if, Jesus, if you said it, it's true, I'm trusting that you'll, you'll, you'll do what you say you'll do. I'm hoping in that. Matter of fact, I'm not only just hoping in that, I'm going to base my life on that hope and live according to your will and your way. That's rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. Now, not only that, we rejoice in suffering. What? Excuse me? I understand rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, but rejoice in suffering? Hold on a second. What, what are you talking about rejoice, boasting and suffering? Boasting and suffering, what does that mean? What that produces in our life is endurance when we rejoice in suffering. It produces purpose. A life lived on purpose, endurance. I'm not just running a long race to run a long race. I'm running a long race because I want to finish and get a crown. It is a life when we rejoice in suffering, we see that the suffering is something there that is so temporary and minute when we get away from it in the future and we see that it produced in us endurance it produced in us, it made us realize that our life is supposed to be lived on purpose to finish what God's called us to do. See, God doesn't just allow suffering in our life just because it's kind of funny for Him and He likes to do that and play games. You know why? To produce and make you realize, guys, suffering's coming to the believer and the unbeliever. It's going to rain on both. It happens because we live in a fallen world. And the suffering doesn't come from God, but you know that he could stop it, but sometimes he doesn't. Why? Why, why, why does he refrain his hand? Why? Because in you is a purpose and a God wants you to realize and live endurance out and not flake out halfway through the race. I mean, if you know people that flake out halfway through the race, it's just too hard. You know, coach, I can't do this. I can't breathe. You know? Yes, you can. Let's move. Let's move. Oh, I took the kids out to the track the other day. I'm talking about endurance. And I said, if I make it into the field house before you, we're going to run a lap around the track. I'm giving you a 10-second head start. Go. And some of them didn't believe me. And so I took off. And I got there. I got to the door, and I put my hand in front of the door. Some of them got in. And the other ones, I said, here, just line up right here. Like, oh, come on, it's Friday. I said, I know. You should have got here. You could have ran in here. Let's, let's, let's go to the track. Ah. And so they started running. I said, don't, don't, don't walk. Don't walk. Ah. And they kept walking. I said, if I run this lap before you, you're going to run another one. They kept walking. All of a sudden, I got on the track and started running. Do you know what they did? Ran. <laughs> ran. They ran. I got to one get, you know, the, the big linemen. Bless their hearts. Bless their hearts. This big man childs, you know. They're bigger than me. And oh, coach, I can't run, you know. Because you're huge, man. You know? You're I mean, you got bigger muscles than me. You're, you know, in seventh grade. You look like a man. And I said, come on, you can run. I can't, I can't. I said, what's wrong? I can't breathe. I said, do this. He goes, oh, you can breathe. <laughs> now move your butt. And he's like, oh. And he started getting mad. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I said, come on, move. And he sprinted the last 100 yards. I said, man, look. I said, sometimes you just got to get mad and just do it. I said, you wouldn't have to do it if you had just listened in the first place. I said, you got to have more endurance than that. Because there's a purpose as to why we do what we do. And when suffering comes, you got to remind yourself of the purpose. Why do I do what I do? Because God's called me to it. There's a reward in it, and God wants me to do it. We've got to rely on that. 
Okay? Not just making you run to make, make you run. Because I like to see kids cry, you know. It also produces in his character Christ likeness. That's a good thing. Suffering does that. I know in my own life, whenever something bad happens, or I feel like I've been wronged, or I feel like I've been talked about, or there's a tragedy or something, I always realize that when I get away from the circumstance, how much more I am more Christ like because of it. It's, it's a weird thing. I've had things happen in my life where I've questioned. God and said, God, why did you allow this to happen? What's going on here? And then the further away I move away from that mountain of suffering, it looks more like a speed bump, and I am the benefit of it because I get to be more like Christ-like. He produces in me a Christ, a character that I didn't know I really had. And suffering will do that. Suffering will do that. Now, this is the favorite thing. It produces in us hope. And it says this, hope does not put us to shame, but hope does not disappoint. That's a double negative for you English teachers. What that means is this, I could rephrase it, hope appoints. Hope appoints. Now I want to watch you watch this. Hope appoints. It is a divine appointment. In the Greek it says it like this, kairos, an appointed season, an appointed season of favor. When we hope, what happens is, is that in our suffering, when we rejoice, it produces in us endurance to finish the race, it produces in us Christ-likeness that we else would not have without the suffering that God allowed, and not only that, but it produces in us a hope, and that hope produces a divine appointment where God takes His hands and mingles them in with your mundane life. And there is a moment where you experience God intervening on your behalf in the midst of your life, however mundane, messed up, wrong, or however hard the suffering, if we hope there is an appointment for you to meet Jesus Christ. For His Spirit and His angels to do a work and that you walk into and you realize this isn't coincidence, this isn't just luck, God did something. God did this. There's no other way around it. How many of you ever had an experience like that in your life where it was a God thing? They call it a God thing. Man, that was a God thing because it happened like that. I know there's experiences like that. It is a Kairos moment. It is a moment because we hope and we rejoice. And guess what? God divinely appoints things in our life that we should walk into them. You know, getting this job here, I talked to a person after I got this job, and he says, man, it is nothing short of a miracle that you got this job because for first-year teachers, they do not hire a school, a school that's this big does not hire first-year teachers. So he goes, I don't know what happened. And I, he, the only thing I can think of is it's a God thing. It's a, you, you daggum right, it's a God thing. That's it. That's it. Because in the midst of my suffering, in the midst of whatever thing I was going through, I rejoiced. It produced in me an endurance that I didn't know I had, and it produced in me character that I didn't know I had. And not only that, but it set up for me a divine appointment to meet the presence of God. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? That's what happens. It's a divine appointment. How does this look lived out? Look at Romans 8.18. It says this. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. What does it look like? It means it, when we live out this this hope of the glory of God, this rejoicing, what does it look like? It means this. It means that we are looking forward to the glory of God and us being glorified, and we will see that our present sufferings were very, very, very extremely temporary. Very, very extremely temporary. Romans 8.31, divine appointment. And I love this, and I'm going to read this, and that's our last scripture. What does living out a divine appointment look like? It looks like this. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who died did not spare his own son, but gave up for us all. How will we not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who uh, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus, the one who died. More than that, who is raised? Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, 
distress, persecution, famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. That's suffering. Name a suffering and it will not separate you from the love of Christ. So what does that mean? It means that we can rejoice and then what happens? A divine appointment happens. It looks in the next scripture. It says this in verse 37. No, in all the suffering, in all the things we go through that are bad, that are horrible, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, angels, rulers, presidents, present things to come, Congress, other world leaders, powers, demonic beings, anything, height, the space, the solar system, or the depth of the ocean, nothing else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. A divine appointment to overcome and conquer because we rejoice because the suffering is temporary and it does not compare to the glory of God. I've never commanded a military army. I have never led a nation. But in the eyes of Jesus Christ, my Savior, I am more than a conqueror. More than Caesar, more than Hitler, more than Napoleon, all of them. You name a conqueror. You name somebody that was great. I am more than that. Why? Because I rejoice in the suffering. Because the hope of the glory of God is coming. Amen? I'll leave, you, I'll leave you with this one last thing. That's what a sanctified look, a life looks like. Check it out. Romans 6, 22. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift, the grace of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. A sanctified life is a saved life, church. A sanctified life is a life that is going to be, on the last day, saved. I'm very sure of it. With that in mind, with that in mind, we should always seek to live holy. 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 Because that's who our God is. Amen?